What is going on YouTube? Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm being interviewed by Shelby Church. She has a channel with over 1 million subscribers and she makes great interactive content here on YouTube. We did an interview, she went through a bunch of questions going over how it got started and what I'm doing now to operate the business. A bunch of beginner level stuff that we covered. I encourage you to stay tuned until the end of the video. If you have any questions or have had any questions regarding this business model, I'm sure we covered them in this video, so stay tuned. Also, I am in Kansas City. This is my ninth unit here in KC. You can look behind me here. It looks really great. I enjoy the way that it's turned out, and I can't wait to get this property live. Before you get into this video, be sure to check out the link down below to SDR Accelerator. This is the most comprehensive Airbnb course that exists on the market. I'm passionate about it, and I put my heart and soul into this product, so therefore I'm able to sit here and tell you if you're looking for a step-by-step -step comprehensive guide on how to do what I do, Go ahead and check it out down below. Without further ado, let's get into the interview. So what is rental arbitrage? Rental arbitrage in a nutshell is you rent a property and then you list it on Airbnb. That's the most broad way to define what it is. Now the way this works is you make money on top of the rent. So mm -hmm. if the rent costs $800 and you're making $1,600, you're not doubling what the rent costs and you keep that margin. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's this margin for profit and that's where this really gets enticing for people is looking at the opportunity and seeing how it's consistently profitable. Then they're, they're just looking at like, I need to scale this up. You know, mm -hmm. one unit you can make an additional, um, you know, thousand dollars a month profit depending on where you're at. And then with two units, you're not making 2000 a month profit. Mm -hmm. And the upside is really, it's limitless because there's ways to increase your revenue and in increase the amount of profit that you're making. So rental yeah. arbitrage is just renting a property, listening on a home training website like Airbnb. Um, VRBO, HomeAway, there's actually 200 or so similar platforms. Do you list on multiple? Airbnb. Absolutely. Oh. Yes, I'm on multiple multiple pro, uh, pro, uh, channels and listing on multiple channels gets complicated because mm -hmm. there's like the calendar integration aspect of it. There's managing bookings from multiple sites, that type of thing. Yeah. It's a little bit more advanced. To, to start out, Airbnb will will keep you profitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, bookings from Airbnb alone can can guarantee that you'll make profit on on the lease. Yeah. And there's extensive market research that goes into this. There's there's various components that you have to look at when you sign one of these leases. Like for example, you don't want to sign a lease where there's no foot traffic or there's no nobody traveling for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And you know, I do say that I come from a small town, but there's two universities there. There's three universities actually. So there's there's it's a college town and there's hospitals, there's various things that would attract people. Mm -hmm. um, and look at the hotel industry and if there's like a hotel somewhere around, it, it, may, it may seem like it's in the middle of nowhere, but if there's a hotel there, they've, they've spent millions on market research. They mm -hmm. know where they're putting their properties, like their hotels, and therefore, the way I like to say it, you know, the way I like to say it is that if there's a hotel, then you can make money on Airbnb with yeah. the there. And so for everyone who's just like looking into this a little bit more, you're just renting out a space and then making money on the rent. Yeah. I think the thing that's so crazy or to me, what was so crazy at first is the fact that you don't own it. Like to me, I was like, how can you not own it? How can you lease it? And they let you do that. But clearly it's working for yeah. people. Totally. There, there's, yeah. a way, there's totally a way that's to do cool. it. And without owning, there's a lot less risk. Obviously, yeah. if you're purchasing a property, you know, you're exposed to, uh, the fact that you're investing twenty thousand, thirty thousand, just for the the deposit on the property, yeah, that type of thing. I mean, in LA, it's probably a lot more, you know, for the twenty percent down. But like yeah, in LA, a, it'd be like hundred, yeah, two hundred. Yeah, totally. yeah. I mean, for somebody who who just has a couple thousand dollars saved up, they can start, uh, you know, cash flowing. Yeah, and that's that's the crazy part about this. And obviously, with that money, you can then invest in actual real estate, which is mm -hmm. the coolest thing. It's like you, you get it experience this income without actually owning the property, which mm. would cost you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to own. Yeah, this that's apartment so cool. Complex. So how did you first get into the whole Airbnb rental arbitrage stuff? I simply heard that it was working for other people uh, mm. and specifically in a podcast, I was listening to a podcast and mm. the gentleman being interviewed was talking about his experience with it yeah. and how it was working really well for him. And that alone, just like that idea was planted and like, I guess the seed was planted and from there, I just went and took action on it and uh, I just saw that it was not that difficult to get into um, and then from there I just really started growing my brand and my company. Yeah. So how did you go about your first one? Like walk me through your first listing and how you found it, okay. decorated it. Everything. Okay. So my first property, this was me without any business knowledge, any business experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty much like 
the most clueless approach to doing it and I would just schedule showings and ask them to Airbnb the space and right off the bat I, I faced a large amount of resistance. Just being faced with that rejection, it, it did hurt a little bit at first, but then you just have to keep pushing forward. I think that's what separates the winners and the losers. Yeah. Because if you can just get over that rejection, you're going to be able to overcome like the next obstacle, that type of thing. Yeah. And so I would go out and just contact people who had properties listed for rent. So on Craigslist, Facebook Market, um, Zillow, like apartments.com, like any, any apartment space or like rental property for rent, um, I would just get in contact with them and um, see if I could make it work. And mm -hmm. all you need is a lease agreement. All you need is like a rental agreement that allows you to to rent the space and Airbnb it. And that was my understanding of what I needed to get done. And you know that's where I faced most of my rejection is bringing up the word Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And there's more refined approaches to how to actually sign a lease that's legal. But for for newbies like for me when I first started, yeah. that was. Kind of my biggest obstacle was mentioning that word. How many rejections was it before one of them finally agreed to it? It was to like the first one. six. I, I believe after being told no six times very abruptly, like very harshly, mm -hmm. um, I was still going after it and I was like, I just got to get through it. It was like a numbers game. I knew that if, yeah. I, if I would just keep persisting that I would eventually find someone who was open to the idea. And it just so happened that the landlord that I signed my first property with, like the property owner, mm -hmm. he was looking for a tenant. Like he just had vacated his property, like the tenants just moved out and he was in need of somebody to fill the space. And I approached him and the, the way that we actually started the conversation, um, when, when I brought up Airbnb is that he, he loved his experience as a guest. Oh. So he was already familiar with what Airbnb was and uh, I think that really warmed up the conversation a little bit to where we got talking about it. And I think he trusted me a little bit after that conversation too, we kind of like yeah. built rapport. And from there, it was just, it's been smooth sailing ever since. He really appreciates me renting his property. Oh, He's cool. very grateful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and you know, honestly, it's like I'm taking really great care of it. And that's something that, I mean, not a lot of like, tenants really can't guarantee that they'll take care of the place. But I mean, that's my business. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have to. You know, it's like I'm, I'm responsible for it. Yeah, you're not just gonna like rent it to a bunch of like people who are gonna like trash it. And if they do trash it, it's it's on me to fix it too. Like that's where I have to step in and you know pay for damages because if I have another guest coming, I mean I can't really like you know that's something I have to take responsibility for. And that's something yeah. that um, anyone looking to get into this they have to really acknowledge is like there's a lot of responsibility with it. Yeah. Do you have any horror stories or has anything gone like crazy wrong ever? I'm glad you asked. Uh, about this time last year, we had an experience that was the worst experience with Airbnb oh. and I mean just the nature of the booking was like it was a red flag right from the start it was like after hours so we have mm. like a designated time that guests can can book mm. and uh, it was kind of like a 10 p.m. type thing where they like wanted to book the place at 10 p.m. Mm. Um, and what had happened we ended up like going against our gut like our gut was telling us don't accept this booking it seemed kind of kind of sketchy and we ended yeah. up accepting it and the individual who, who came uh, they like moved in somehow like they, they, they brought a bunch of their personal items and they what? were in they were just space. planning on like living in it yeah and like they, they had re completely redecorated the entire house uh, mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were there for 11 nights in that time they like redid the bedrooms they had put up like their own personal um, like pictures on the walls that type That's of thing crazy. it was really weird like the, the, the vibe and the energy in there was really strange so they booked it for 11 nights yeah okay and, and you know, to me, I, I just thought like, okay, let's just see where this goes. But my intuition, yeah. like my, my gut was telling me like, this is going to be like a weird interaction. Yeah. And on the day of checkout, we go there and they have like tubs of their stuff still in the property. And that was like the horror part of it is that they were still there and we needed, yeah. we had guests coming that, that afternoon. And so I was like moving them out of the house and it was oh kind of, it, it was like something I never wanted to do because you know, you have to kind of just like you know, put your foot down and say, hey, get out of here. Yeah. Um, and that was ultimately like my worst experience with it. And it wasn't really, I mean, they didn't damage the place or anything like that. I do think that they smoked in the place though, mm -hmm. which again is uh, I feel like that probably happens a lot. Yeah. With like rental car, rental anything. Mm -hmm. Like you can just tell. You yeah, get into yeah, rental it's cards, like, yeah. like every one of them has Absolutely. that smell. Yeah. Um, so they ended up leaving. I moved them out. I, okay. I, I took their stuff to a, a storage locker, like a, like a, a cold storage where you just hold Love stuff. It. Um, so were they like resisting it like they wanted no, to stay okay but we were in I mean I, I don't know I, I don't think they understood what was going on I told them, like this is Airbnb you're not allowed to like move in and I like was they to, thought they could I, I think they did I mean otherwise that makes <laughs> so no sense. weird yeah that's why they would I think that's something you have to acknowledge but 
the reality of transient gas is that you can just kick them out. There's not like anything keeping them in the property. Mm -hmm. So you can just authoritatively like kick them out of the place. Yeah. Do you think if they like really tried to stay, then it would be an issue if they're like, no, I'm not leaving. Absolutely. So like one of the biggest horror story videos on YouTube um, is this video of people that didn't want to leave and it has like 3 million views right now. Yeah. Um, but it's just like this, this footage of these people that weren't getting out of the place mm -hmm. and they had like, it was just causing like a problem. Dang. So yeah, that's I mean, crazy. that's one, one out of hundreds of people that have booked my yeah. properties. So with your first listing, if you remember, how much did it cost and when did you break even and start making a profit on it? Okay. For my first property, I was very cheap about the approach mm -hmm. and that really brought my cost down a lot. So my cost was like $3,800 total. I'm um, including the lease and the security deposit and all that stuff too. Okay. So, I mean, total furniture cost was probably like 2500 and that's because I was on Craigslist. I was just getting odds and ends that would fit and kind of like fill the need. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really care about the interior design much and I didn't care about um, just the aesthetic of it. I was just trying to like see, like test the model. Yeah. And for a long time that, that would work, right? Like we would book with like the most random like interior design. And um, realistically over time, we had to improve the aesthetic of the place because it wasn't getting booked as often. Mm, so that, it does matter. It does matter, absolutely. So this place do you think is gonna be, I feel like it's pretty bad. It, this place design. will work and I'll tell yeah. you like, for right now, I don't know how long this will last, but mm. this place will work for probably the next year or two. I'm um, just from, from my understanding of, of how this market is like, it's shifting. Yeah. And more professional hosts will enter the market and take over. I mean, it's obviously like, you want to make sure you have the best hospitality, the best customer service, and that really will come down to how you style the place and how you make the, yeah. the, the person feel when they're experiencing your Airbnb. Yeah. And with that being said, I mean, the total cost for my property was, was relatively low, and it took me, I think, five months total to recoup all of that invested amount. I'm um, just from net profits. Obviously, this is there's a lot of cash in this business model because you're, you're booking, um, I mean, thousands of dollars of, of bookings, but there yeah. are also a lot of expenses you have to consider. I mean, you have the rent, which is the biggest one, and then utilities and any other like costs that would come in, like internet, um, yeah. trash service, that type of thing. So ultimately, you know, you will see your money back, like guaranteed. I don't want to say guaranteed, but like, you'll see your money back with time. And uh, that's, that's how long it took, Yeah. Like five months. Do you know for that first year, the costs versus how much it made? Yeah, so the first year, the costs were roughly $14,000 mm -hmm. and the property generated $20,000. Um, first year, I feel like market. that's yeah. really good. And that was just me without any experience mm -hmm. uh, regarding Airbnb or like real estate in general. You know, I always had the thought of, of getting into real estate and this was kind of my in, but then yeah. I realized this is not really a real estate um, opportunity. It's like more of a hospitality opportunity. Right. So you're competing with hotels, you're taking clientele away from hotels, that type of thing. and yeah, my first year was really great, which really like motivated me to start documenting it on YouTube and, and also start scaling. To, yeah. I think going from one to two is like a big jump just because like now you have two leases, you have two properties to worry about. Yeah. And, and so on and so forth. Going from, from two to four, like you know, two to six, that type of thing. Um, just the scalability of it is, is definitely a new learning curve, which I'm currently experiencing right now. So Yeah. How much time would you say the first one took out of your day. The nature of this is that you, you turn over the property if you're not outsourcing anything mm -hmm. and that takes maybe one to two hours per turnover. And the way we would do this is we would encourage longer bookings. So we'd have about five bookings a month mm -hmm. and therefore um, it's about 10 hours out of the entire month that you'd actually put into turning the, the place over, getting it ready for the next guest. Mm -hmm. um, that was at first, you know, that was when I first started. Obviously now the, the way I run it is very different. I mean, I have a cleaning company that I, I, I've kind of negotiated the price that they, they pay for turnover and yeah. we kind of have it streamlined to where we're not there at all. So at, at, at the beginning, you, you need to put a couple of hours a day if you have a turnover into the cleaning process and, and getting everything like the linen switched out, that type of thing, going to make sure the place is clean. So you were just like cleaning it yourself at yeah. first? Oh, okay. absolutely. Because I had no idea. Like, look, I have a customer coming. Like I had nothing set up. I had no, nothing structured yeah and i was like okay i have to get in there and like walk back the floor um mop, right. mop the floor like wipe everything down get it cleaned up and you know that's one of the most important components of this business is the cleaning aspect of it yeah um because if you have a guest coming and the place is dirty or there's something that's not up to you know up to standard with 
cleanliness, then that's going to be a big like red flag. Yeah, I feel like that's number one. Yeah, like absolutely. interior design, you can kind of forgive, but if it feels gross, yeah. it's like. Mm, and for me, wow. that was the thing that I kind of had to learn right away. Like, look, this is there's multiple pieces moving here. I have mm -hmm. to, you know, just just learn everything that needs to be learned, and I think that takes time too. I couldn't just scale from the beginning because I had no idea like what I was getting into. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time kind of refining everything and getting everything to where I knew exactly what needed to be done and like the time it took and kind of just, you know, just operating a, a smooth operation with, with right. business. So at first you would say about 10 hours a month? Yes. And, and that's listing. the beauty of it yeah. because if you have like a six day booking, you, you turn over once and then for the rest of the time, and in most cases you don't need to to do anything you're just, yeah. just sitting there so you wouldn't recommend if someone books for like one or two nights no so our minimum is a two night stay okay I mean, that's just hands down that's just like a, a, a protocol we have is two night stay because that one night turnover and i did experience this at first is there's like one night back to back to back it, like you're in there constantly cleaning mm -hmm. constantly turning over and it's not worth it i think the money's better for longer bookings too yeah um, and and the newbies will have these one-nighters too They'll have like their calendar available for one night bookings and that really just kind of scatters uh, the, I mean the flow. So you want like a, a two week booking, right? Like that's, that's like an ideal booking that you'd get. And if there's like a one nighter right where they would book for two weeks, like in the middle of it, it messes up the amount of money that you can make. For sure. So that's one of the things that I learned. Yeah. Early on. So what was the most important part of automating it? Was that like getting the cleaning set up first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the most important part of automating is definitely finding re reliable cleaners and this is a very big um, gap in the market right now. Mm -hmm. There's not really a great solution for finding cleaners mm -hmm. and that's just the nature of it. I mean, I, I have a Facebook group with, with 5,000 members and everyone in there, um, or anyone in Facebook groups across the board that I'm in, everybody related, they're constantly looking for cleaners. Oh, um, and, and so that's like the big Yeah, it's, it's just the big thing that you have to uh, figure out. Yeah. And for a long time, like we'd have just these, um, these like homemakers that would just turn over properties mm -hmm. or clean properties for a living and we'd have them come clean the place. And then, but the, the reason that's not scalable is because they charge really high for like their service. So they'll do like 80 to a hundred dollars oh. to clean the place. And that's not yeah. like, you know, that's what they're used to doing. And therefore finding a solution where you can negotiate the price down uh, to $50 ideally yeah. for turnover. That's like where we're at right now. So, okay, nice. Yeah, that's one of the biggest parts of automating and then also communications. So I do communications now myself. I can mm -hmm. easily just go on the phone and, and if there's a question or if there's anything that comes up, I'll take a phone call. I'll just communicate with the guest and get it resolved. Mm -hmm. But you need somebody on the ground. That's hands down. Um, yeah. So you do it. that. You take care of that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. right now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in LA. I'm just, I'm, I'm dealing with guests. Like yesterday I was on the phone with um, I was on the phone with a guest, uh, they were having trouble checking in. Mm -hmm. um, it was their first time using the platform, so that type oh, of thing. Yeah. It's just one of those things that you need communications and you need people on the ground. And for anyone looking to get yeah. started, those are two things that you have to consider if you, were, if you want to step away from the business. Yeah. Can you outsource the communications if you want to or do you feel like that takes a big chunk of the profit? You can and there's currently a software called Guesty. Mm -hmm. And they take three percent of the booking, so three percent is it's not very much. That's what Airbnb takes. Uh, Just three. Oh. And, and so yeah, it's, that's pretty low. It's not a lot of money, but then again, like they're not. I've looked into them a little bit, and they're not like providing a communication solution. What they do, they have you make FAQs, mm -hmm. and they'll just send the FAQ. Like if there's a question regarding one thing, they'll just that's how they kind of automate. Oh, so it's it. like a bot. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a software, so it's not like really personal. Yeah. And I don't know how people feel about that. I don't know if people like would would like to experience an actual host, like hosting the place, and, and yeah. kind of have that personal connection. You know, I think that's why people like Airbnb too. Is there's there's a big distinction between like a corporate hotel chain mm -hmm. that doesn't care about you as a guest versus you know one single family homeowner who's offering you their home, and then you're in there, and then there's like a personal connection. That's probably one of the things that draws. Uh, guests to Airbnb. At that point, did you still have a full-time job you were doing or what, how were you doing Airbnb? Like, how did you all make that work at first? The story behind that, um, it's probably for a different video, but I, I sold Bitcoin at 20,000. And so I had like this oh. big chunk of change. Uh, this actually, is, whoa, this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I sold Bitcoin at 19,000, I say 20,000, I just rounded up. I mean, yeah. it was like the, the, the tippity top of what it could have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have the, the screenshot of like the sell order. So 
that really put me in a different position to explore different income opportunities. Yeah, like try something. Yeah, and so okay. I quit my job um, in, in March 2018, and I was sitting on this money. I, I was like, I need to do something with it. Like, I need mm-hmm. to invest it. I need to create income streams. So, like, build systems. That's yeah. like, where I was kind of sitting. So I had a lot of time to explore different ventures. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wrote out business plans to, like, start Amazon FBA. You know, I know you made that video. Yeah. So that was one thing. I, I still have all the notes I was going to start. You know, I just had this this time where I tested different things. Mm-hmm. And, did you test Amazon FBA? Or yeah, did you? I mean, I, I Yeah, what was did. your experience with You that? know, I was looking at, like, the whole, like, fulfillment uh, yeah. aspect of it. And it was just, like, there's this big risk of buying product that wasn't going to sell. Yeah. Was, like, you know, I... I wasn't really that knowledgeable on what would sell, what wouldn't. And like, there's a lot of market research that goes into that like mm. product research. And so I kind of just let that, you know, I didn't really get, I didn't delve deep into that. And so this whole rental arbitrage thing came up because I was looking for like a system that I could build that could make money for me. Mm. And that's really where I put a lot. I mean, yeah, I, I put a lot of time and, and effort into being successful with it. And then yeah. again, like I started a YouTube channel, which helped with the income and then I saw a course as well, mm-hmm. like an information product. That, yes, you have a few different. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I kind of have a various few income streams right now that, you know, over time those were growing as mm-hmm. I was growing. So it was just yeah. one of those things where I was grateful to have experienced that. What were you doing for work before you quit, I guess? Before I quit, I was yeah. working at a warehouse unloading semis. Oh, wow. So I got a job and I would unload product off of a, like an 18-wheeler, like a mm-hmm. semi truck, and then I would break the product down on the dock and kind of just look at numbers all day, kind of matching yeah. matching uh, serial numbers and stuff. And so I was working with boxes, like unloading stuff. My brain was constantly working and I was earning a pretty decent wage yeah. uh, for what I was doing. And then in one year I got promoted to like a lead position because of like my work ethic and how I outworked everybody. And mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm confident in saying that that like work ethic helped me get to where I'm at right now too. Like being able to, you know, just structure my time, like time management, Mm-hmm. Um, on my own that's one of my biggest obstacles that I had to overcome uh, just, yeah because going you know, from a job that's very structured to just mm-hmm. doing everything yourself totally. at first was it kind of weird it took four months for me to do something like yeah. I was I had I you know I was sitting on this money which I think kind of um, it was bad in a way because I was like comfortable but mm-hmm. then um, yeah I was I definitely had no idea what to do with my time so I, I would yeah. like the day would start and then I would have no plan like nothing written out nothing to do and then that was where I really learned how to structure my time. Yeah, it like, it it's super months. weird at first because I yeah. feel like everyone's like, oh, the dream is to work for yourself. But then you're like, wait, how do I do this? Yeah, absolutely. And for <laughs> everyone, yeah, I mean, yeah. realistically, this this can be something that you can do full time. Mm-hmm. And obviously, like the numbers are there, like the, the amount of demand for what you're doing is there. It's just going to take, I'd say, a couple of listings. With one, yeah. you know, it's something that... Um, you know, it's supplemental income. I like to think of it as just like additional household income that you can make yeah. for like minimal effort. And that's really the nature of, of this business. But to completely sustain yourself off of it, you need, like I would say the comfortable number is like five to six listings. Okay, I was gonna ask that. Okay. okay. And, and at, at five to six, depending on the market, you're, you're gonna be bringing in like a six figure income. There's strategic things that uh, the average person won't know about that you can yeah. do to really like optimize that. Yeah. And the the rent costs. So, with this business model, you're you're on average doubling the rent, tripling the rent, and mm-hmm. therefore, I mean, these are very like they're very general numbers. But there's yeah. depending on where you're at, you can you can cash flow really well. They're really good margins, and if you're doing the the right way and you're optimizing all your costs and you look at yeah. it like very with like an analytical perspective, you're going to you know maximize profits. Yeah. So with five to six listings. Is that including costs? Yeah, so okay. right now, um, with I currently have eight listings, mm-hmm. and the projected revenue for these eight is $160,000. You know, and I, I'm obviously documenting all this on my YouTube channel as mm-hmm. well, so people can uh, tune in and kind of see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And that right there is why I started doing it. I thought it would be interesting for people to see um, me going from starting out like mm-hmm. as, as a complete newbie, or like a beginner, and then seeing where I can take it. Yeah, that's and super so, interesting. Yeah. And that CPM doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. um, how do you go about pricing? Because you don't want to go too high where no one's going to book it. Mm-hmm. So how do you find that like perfect number? You have to look at what hotels are asking and what other hosts in the area are asking. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's a price war going on with the short-term rental like, hosts. Yeah. Like, they, always, they always try to undercut each other with, with price. 
Um, realistically, if you're host watching this, I think the best way to do it is just to raise your prices. Uh, like as a whole community, if every host were to raise their prices, then they would all book at a higher price and make more profit. Uh, the truth is the average hotel nightly rate in the United States is $103 a night. Mm. That's, so, this was 136 Yeah, and so if you look at it that way, the hotel gives you a standard room with like, you know, a TV, like a TV stand, yeah. a bed. There's not much that goes into it with a traditional hotel. And when you look at it, like the value that you're getting um, with an apartment, you have your private space, you have a kitchen, you have multiple like beds. So for example, there's a bedroom and then there's like, uh, there's a bed out here, like in the mm -hmm. living room area. So if you do it right, you are offering a lot more value to your customer and your clients than what a hotel is. Yeah. And you're realistically undercutting the hotel industry. So with pricing, it obviously depends on the market that you're in. If every host is asking $50 for their space, you're not going to be able to ask much more than that. Mm -hmm. But if, and, and, and I think it, it depends on the space too. So what, what you have to offer really weighs in on how much you can ask. Yeah. And typically the more, the more people that you can sleep in your unit, the more money you can make because the hotels can't compete. So let's say there's a party of nine people that need to have a place to stay. If they're going to hotels, they're paying for two bedrooms at least, you know, two yeah. or three bedrooms. Um, and with, with an Airbnb that can sleep nine people, they're, they're all going to be in the same space and they can comfortably, you know, be, uh, they could be in the space for much lower of a cost. Yeah, it makes way more sense mm -hmm. with big groups, I feel like, especially. Yeah. So with your first listing, were you afraid at all that no one was going to book it? This was a big concern I had, like, in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that I was putting all this money into the lease, like the furniture, the property, knowing I would have rent coming up, like, the next month, and so yeah. on and so forth. I was kind of thinking about it, and when I listed the place, I got three bookings within an hour. And what? that right there kind what? of blew me That's away. Crazy. Yeah, we were... Um, it, it was just such a great experience too because it was like, wow, like this is, you know, it was instant. And that really kind of reinforced my decision too because the demand is so high for yeah. people looking for a place to sleep. Uh, there's so many travelers. There's so yeah. many people constantly, you know, visiting family, visiting friends, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, maybe funerals, weddings. I mean, there's constantly this, this insane amount of people traveling and if you have a place that looks great and looks like an affordable price point too like people will book it and yeah. that right there got me really excited and that's the only reason i never kind of like quit i think i would have had a different experience with it if i had listed my property nobody booked mm -hmm. for like a week or like whatever i mean i i had a really great first-hand experience and yeah. that really got me positively thinking about what i could do with this and this was in missouri right like yeah. this isn't like la where people are like such a destination to travel to like even somewhere that's a little more, I don't know, like you don't think of it as a travel destination, it works. Absolutely. And the reason being is because there's people everywhere mm -hmm. and people like know people or like there's people coming to visit for, for various reasons. And, yeah. you know, people would ask me, who are these people coming to like book your place? Who are these guests? And then the truth is, I don't know, like why are people coming to Springfield, Missouri about places? It's the yeah. population there is like 200,000, I think, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's not very big at all. And... The fact that it works there just really speaks volumes. The fact that I can sure. I can make that much money and people travel to like the most off the map city yeah. I mean, compared to like what you have like in LA, there's like nobody in Springfield. Yeah. There's nothing going on in Springfield. So um, yeah, that alone just says a lot about this opportunity. Yeah. Um, okay, so how many Airbnbs do you think you can possibly have? Is there a limit? Like how, how do what do you think of all that? I don't think there's a limit. And I personally, I'm striving for a hundred this year, which is like That's a amazing. huge, huge yeah. uh, goal, but I think it's totally doable. Mm -hmm. And from there, I mean, professionally, you could look at having a thousand, 2000 units. And there's already uh, companies doing this mm -hmm. where they're at that number. And there's, I, I believe one is at 8,000 right now worldwide. Then we're talking like this is a multi-million dollar business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, this is this gets really serious at that point. And yeah. Obviously, the way I started to getting to there, there's there's a lot of uh, you know moving pieces that have to fall into place mm -hmm. to fully operate at that level. But that's where I'm going with this, and like it's something I'm passionate about. I'm I'm happy that I could provide people with an affordable place to sleep. Mm -hmm. and I can give them you know something different rather than like the cookie cutter hotels that haven't been improved on or innovated on. Yeah. For, for decades. I mean, look back to like the 1930s hotels are like the same. I mean, so there's this huge industry that hasn't improved 
And I think the internet is now here to teach it a lesson. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you see with Airbnb and these other um, apartment style hotels. You see this commonly across the board, like they're, they're technology based. So all of their customers, everything, all the interaction is based off of tech and you can't compete with technology. Mm -hmm. And so the hotel industry, I see them being very proactive. I see um, some hotels like adapting to the apartment style accommodation and mm -hmm. they're kind of putting kitchens and little things to add value to their spaces. Right. But realistically, I don't think there's a limit based off of the, the sole fact that every human needs to sleep. And we don't know why. Yeah. We just, we just dive into to sleep every single night um, and we can't control that. And if we don't sleep, then things don't really go our way. Yeah, so it don't work at all. That's, that's where you make your money, just the fact that everybody needs to sleep. Mm -hmm. And there's constant people traveling. Um, the, the market cap base around accommodation is insanely huge. And this is something that I just recently had come across too, just knowing that hotels are making billions of dollars. Yeah. Um, like hundreds of billions of dollars, actually. I don't think people really understand the, how, you know, like the size, the size of the market. Of it. Yeah, 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 saying it is one thing, but looking at how big it is, I mean, that's like the size of oil. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty insane. What do you think of cities that are starting to put a ban on this? Like I know in LA, they're getting way more strict about mm -hmm. it. Do you think it works in some cities and not others? And I think time will tell that. I think we're yeah. in a very gray area with this opportunity right now because there are these city bans and these like local municipalities that crack down and say don't do this mm -hmm. but the nature of it is that you can't stop it um and this is something that i've you know i've seen across the board like right we're in la and somebody's cl clearly doing this and you're, you're wondering if there's a restriction against doing it well, how is it being done and the truth is you can't stop what is being done here and i think airbnb is the reason that that's the way it is Mm -hmm. um, anybody could get on the app and list the space and nobody will know. I mean, there's, there's softwares that are coming out. There's companies that are just like popping up, trying to stop this, like, and kind of making sure properties are, are legally permitted, mm -hmm. but it takes, it's such a time consuming thing. There's not enough resources, there's not enough people working with the city, like the government to, to actually stop what's going on. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that. And I think doing it the right way. And, and having the like you know the good intention from the beginning is always going to be the what lasts the longest. But in, in this case, I see the restrictions being more of like a, an oppression from hotels rather than just a common sense you know restriction or a permit. For yeah. These properties. How much now do you spend on furniture in a new listing? Right now, my the cost per unit is like five thousand six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's it's gone up a little bit from my initial like thirty eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I've put a lot more emphasis on the furnishings, like the the interior design, the aesthetic, because it stands out. I mean with more people flooding the space and I say this because even where I'm at in Springfield, when I started hosting there was hundred and seventy two listings total. Mm -hmm. Now there's over five hundred oh, in that short amount in of time. one year? Yeah. Whoa. So it's really That's blown crazy. Up. Yeah. I mean it sounds crazy when you say it like that, but when you look at a hotel, they have 300, 400 rooms mm -hmm. available every single night. And 500 total listings in an area isn't that much. I Very mean, true. That gives you an idea because like once I book out, you know, my calendar is done for. Like it's, it's off the market. And then therefore like the next host can take that, um, th those bookings and so on and so forth. Yeah. But the reality of it is the hotels are the ones that control the market right now. And they, they take all the bookings. Yeah. Um, they're kind of like the default yeah. and then people that are like with it are like Airbnb. Absolutely. So yeah, the cost has gone, it's gone up a little bit yeah. just because I'm, I'm trying to play chess. Like I, I'm looking at what's happening. I want to make sure that I future proof myself mm -hmm. in the sense that there's nicer furniture. There's more of a quality taste to my stays. Like my, my yeah. Properties. Where do you get the actual furniture? All of it on Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, everything from, from like, the toiletries to mm -hmm. the furniture to the TVs. I mean, it's just everything. all delivered to the door. That's yeah. way easier. It's way easier. And that, you know, that makes it easy when you're scaling too. being able to order it online and it, you just unbox it, set it up. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this and found it valuable. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more videos coming up here in KC. I'm out here. I've been here for the past three weeks trying to get leases, trying to scale a business. Be sure to stay tuned for what's to come. If you enjoyed, once again, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe. I will see you in the next video.